get started. Um, we'll have a couple people joining us um, probably in the first uh, five minutes or so. Um, just a reminder, um, I have muted everybody's line because I do have the speaker with me in person, um, but just in case something happens with technology, um, please do not put us on hold. We will hear your hold music if the technology goes bad, um, so make sure if you have any background noise just to press that mute button um, just in case. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Jeff Desjardin. Um, he's been an instrumental part of our Antimicrobial Stewardship Collaborative Steering Committee, um, and he is with Western Infectious Diseases. He's going to talk this morning about the crossover um, and conflict between antimicrobial stewardship and sepsis guidelines. Good morning, everyone. Um, this uh, topic came about with regard to a lot of questions, especially from some of our critical access hospitals on how do you balance stewardship with um, providing antibiotics in sepsis. So this is your critically ill patient where you don't want to miss anything, but at the same time try to have some uh, guidelines, if you will, on which antibiotics to use so we're not over-utilizing antibiotics. And so the, the general issue is how do you balance that with regard to risk versus reward. In a lot of this, probably many of you already know with regard to the, the conflicts and the benefits of stewardship and sepsis, the conflicts are that if we give too few antibiotics, and this comes up a lot when we talk to our, especially our ED colleagues and our critical care colleagues, I want to give enough antibiotics so that the patient doesn't die. How, <clears throat> but we as infectious disease doctors and antimicrobial stewards also want to have some say in which antibiotics are picking. With regard to using stewardship in sepsis, there are difficulties in showing benefit in some outcomes with regard to mortality and length of stay. The conflicts also arise with regard to how much confidence physicians have in the stewardship program. And if you look at actual data with regard to this, and especially if you talk to some of our ID, ID pharmacists who are on the front line with regard to governing a little bit of this antibiotic use, oppositions by some physicians can be up to 30 percent. And that is an issue. And that's really where your physician champion has to come into play, and sometimes also administration. Is there an issue with regard to using antibiotics um, and simply altering the resistance patterns to those unrestricted antibiotics? So in other words, if we restrict category A, are we simply going to make category B more resistant and then have this sort of fluctuating pattern where we use one th category of antibiotic a little less and then we see another antibiotic rise to the forefront with regard to resistance and that has been shown in some arenas. A lot of our physician colleagues will ask us about medical liability concerns and I've had even ED physicians, you know, when we've talked about limiting antibiotic use, ask if I'm going to come help defend them in a lawsuit when they might, in their mind, pick the wrong antibiotics because we've told them to limit its use. And also, as many of you know, there are numerous quality measures with regard to giving antibiotics in a timely manner and appropriate antibiotics, and there are concerns about meeting quality measures in that regard. The benefits are pretty common sense, if you think about it. Reductions in antimicrobial utilization, and that's measured in daily doses per 1,000 patient days. Clearly, we as stewards can guide them to antibiotics that have, are less expensive. And obvious things that the pharmacists are interested in with regard to fewer antimicrobial adverse events and fewer drug-drug reactions. Hopefully, we can show resistant, reduction in resistance rates when we limit our antibiotic use. Obviously, fewer secondary infections. And then hopefully, improve patient more patient outcomes with regard to mortality and length of stay, but as I mentioned, that sometimes is difficult to do. So that's the conundrum we face. And I thought what we talk about is one of the most common topics that comes up in the septic patient is which antibiotics do I pick so that I can stay again within some framework of being a good steward. And when you look at antibiotic usage, 
in sepsis, choice clearly matters. It is very common in retrospective studies to see that inappropriate therapy is given about 32% of the time. So this either because they picked the wrong antibiotic based on the disease process or for the pathogen. Mortality, mortality is increased definitely in the patients who receive the incorrect antibiotic. When you look at antibiotics specifically for sepsis as opposed to uh, a specific end organ process, so we are giving empiric antibiotics and we don't know where the patient's infection is, there are no specific guidelines. So again, talking to ED colleagues and critical care colleagues who are mostly seeing these patients in the front line, it is recommended that you give broad spectrum activity. And by that I mean you're covering both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. And in a little bit we'll, we'll come up and talk about that gram-positive coverage should include coverage for MRSA. And again, that seems contradictory to being a good steward, but again, we are trying to keep the patient alive as rule number one. There may be indications when you even give more than one drug. If you work in an institution or you have a specific patient or you have a lot of drug resistance amongst your gram-negative pathogens. And when you look at combination therapy, we've gone away really from talking about synergy with regard to gram-negative pathogens. It's not so much that you're providing synergy, you're picking two drugs so that the hope is that at least one of those drugs is effective and again that the patient doesn't have an adverse outcome. When we talk about MRSA, we have to change a little bit our thinking, and I, I'm sure most of us have by now, but it is not just that this is a hospital-acquired pathogen anymore, and that line between healthcare-associated and community-associated MRSA infection is significantly blurred. It is clear now that patients can develop MRSA colonization in one arena and develop manifestations of that infection in another, and I will tell you that in the EDs, now if you look at data, the most common presentation of the ED with regard to a skin and soft tissue infection, that, that most common pathogen is MRSA, especially when you look at purulent cellulitis or abscesses. So the bottom line with this, if you are going to cover somebody for sepsis, you need to include something that has MRSA activity. Most of those drugs are pretty well known. Vancomycin is still your first choice. There are rare instances where vancomycin isn't effective for MRSA, but in our community, you can use it with confidence. It also is inexpensive, and it has a pretty narrow spectrum of activity, which is important. Daptomycin is another agent that can be used, but remember that this can only be used for non-pulmonary infections. Zyvox or linozolid is appropriate in other instances, especially when you're treating community-acquired MRSA pneumonia. Again, remember this is not a bacterial cytal agent, so we prefer the first two. Lastly, ceftaroline is another agent if you're forced into corner with either allergies or drug interactions. And ceftaroline has the advantage of having some gram-negative coverage for certain disease processes that may be indicated. But again, if you're trying to be a good steward, you may want to limit your coverage to just specific agents that have MRSA, MRSA activity because again we're talking about sepsis and so probably your other agents you're going to add other agents anyway. With regard to gram negative coverage you have to have a little bit of an idea in mind if you need to cover for pseudomonas or not and there are some nuances there. If we talk about covering for gram-negative infections and you don't think pseudomonas is a likely pathogen, and we'll get to what those risk factors are in a minute, you're really looking at either triaxone or cefepime or a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor such as zosin. Those would be my two favorite choices in this instance when you are covering empirically for sepsis and you need a gram-negative drug. Carbapenems would be appropriate and these would may, maybe be either imipenem or meropenem, or if pseudomonas is unlikely, you could use ertapenem. But again, a little later on, I'm going to talk about carbapenem sparing and the importance of that. And so that is one thing we are really pushing in the hospitals we cover, 
in the Centura system and at the Sisters of Charity hospitals because we want to limit our carbapenem use if at all possible and that has to do with reducing your likelihood of developing CRE in your hospital. Other choices would include a monolactam such as astreanam or fluoroquinolone. In a little bit later I'll show you some resistance pattern data that may make those less attractive as initial therapy in sepsis. With regard to pseudomonas being possible, here are your risk factors. So if you look at people who develop sepsis while they are hospitals, hospitalized and they develop pneumonia, so they have a hospital acquired pneumonia, it is still your most common organism. So that would be one indication to use an anti-pseudomonal drug. And if you remember my last slide, really most of those antibiotics I mentioned do cover pseudomonas anyway. In the community acquired setting where people come in with septic shock and they have no known source and you want to cover for pseudomonas, those risk factors would be people who are immunocompromised, people who have HIV, solid organ transplant, cancer chemotherapy, and our whole cadre of patients who are receiving immunomodulatory agents for rheumatoid arthritis and the like. If they've had heavy recent prior antibiotic use, usually defined as IV antibiotics within 90 days, consider them also maybe an increased risk for pseudomonas, cirrhotics, and then clearly a, a greater risk is, are people with structural lung abnormalities. A lot of hospitals won't see cystic fibrosis patients, but you may see people who have bronchiectasis who, or who have repeated exacerbations of COPD. These are your risk factors for pseudomonas. So when you pick an agent that covers gram-negative um, organisms, you want to consider these risk factors. Again, the only difference really from the slide I showed initially is that you cannot use ceftriaxone, so ceftazidime or cefepime would be indicated. Your zosin type agents would cover them. Your carbapenems, as long as it's not ertapenem, would cover pseudomonas. Fluoroquinolones, generally, if you look at the in vitro data, ciprofloxacin has a little bit better activity versus levofloxacin. Your amino glycosides could be used. And again, if you're covering pseudomonas, tobramycin is generally preferred. It has a little better coverage than gentamicin in vitro. Amicacin also could be used, but we try to reserve amicacin because sometimes it is our last bastion of activity against some of our multidrug resistant pathogens. And then finally, as trinam could be used as well. Again, based on most of the metro um, Denver area, as trinam does not it has about up to 80% activity against pseudomonas, but it's not the best. Sorry, I skipped ahead there. When you cover pseudomonas and patients are critically ill, I'm talking about the patient with septic shock, intubated on a couple pressors. Generally speaking, you probably should pick two antibiotics from two different classes. So you have to know a little bit about your resistance pattern to pseudomonas for one thing. And at Lutheran Medical Center, for instance, and this is similar at most of the hospitals we cover, which are St. Anthony, St. Anthony's North, and some of the northern hospitals, you can see that really cefepime and piptazo, those two drugs have over 90% activity against pseudomonas. So you're pretty comfortable for most patients that you're going to cover them. Tobermycin is the best. And if I have a patient who I'm called on from the ED who is critically ill and we think pseudomonas is a possible uh, pathogen. And if I'm worried about drug resistance at all, I would probably pick cefepime and tobra or zosin and tobra. And I know a lot of people get worried about giving them glycoside because of these patients are often in renal failure. But just giving them one dose in general will not exacerbate their renal dysfunction and it will provide coverage until such time where you have hopefully some microbiologic data to fine-tune your antibiotics. So that's my favorite combination. You can see that there's a misconception, I think, in many of the hospitals I work at where people want to give miropenem or imipenem because that's, quote, the best drug against pseudomonas, unquote. At Lutheran, and this is mirrored by many other hospitals in the front range, it is not as good in, with regard to its antibiogram, and at least in our hospitals, when you compare it to cefepime and piptazo and that's probably because of overutilization. So really for the most part you should be comfortable with piptase or cefepime. Miropenem is not as good 
at least in many of the antibiograms at the hospitals we work out of. You can see similarly Levaquin falls off down to less than 80% and S3NM is down as low as 72%. So if I were going to give empiric treatment with Levofloxacin or S3NM as my backbone of therapy, I definitely would have another agent uh, against Pseudomonas if they were critically ill. And again, it's not so much for synergy, is that you are making sure you don't pick the wrong antibiotic and the patient is not covered appropriately for possible drug resistant pseudomonas. We talked a little bit about carbapenem sparing and the, the, the big reason there is we're trying to limit exposure to carbapenem so we don't have too much CRE. Now fortunately at least in the hospitals I work at, we don't see a lot of CRE but places on the East Coast and on the coast in general see this as significant problem in their hospitals. Uh, having said that, I will agree that it's not just carbapenems that put you at risk for developing carbapenemase producing organisms. Even if you look at cephalosporin use prior to developing CRE, that is a risk factor as well. However, most institutions, and I think if you talk to people, nationwide they are trying to develop carbapenem sparing regimens so that we can hopefully increase our resistance or decrease our resistance rates to carbapenem amongst our, some of our gram negatives and we have seen at Lutheran anecdotally I will tell you a steady rise in our activity that miropenem, miropenem has against pseudomonas since we've been limiting carbapenem use and that even goes for the community when people come from the community it's very common for Surgeons to want to give ertapenem for intra-abdominal infections because it's easy, it's one gram a day. But if the patient's hospitalized, we've really pushed our surgeons to using combinations such as rocephin and flagyl, which has excellent activity in most, against most of the community-acquired pathogens in our hospital, or something like zosin. So that's one thing where you can really impact, I think, uh, antimicrobial prescribing practices is using the concept of carbapenem sparing. This topic has come up a lot in some of my other colleagues who've gone from CHA across the state with regard to how do we use procalcitonin and should we use procalcitonin. Obviously, you have to be able to use procalcitonin on site in a timely manner if you're going to use it at all. And just as a brief review, procalcitonin is a peptide precursor of calcitonin. It's released by parenchyma cells in response to specific bacterial infections and that is in contrast to viral infections which actually may downregulate procalcitonin use. So it is specific for bacterial infection or in theory specific for bacterial infections. Most of the best data, at least right now, there's growing data on the concept of procalcitonin, but most of the best data is probably in distinguishing bacterial versus non-bacterial or non-infectious causes of people who come in with quote pneumonia. So this is your ER patient uh, who comes in and can't give a good history and it's read as an infiltrate. Is it pulmonary edema? Is it CHF? Is it viral pneumonia? Or is it bacterial pneumonia? In those patients, a procalcitonin can be quite helpful. If you look at algorithms which use procalcitonin, I will tell you that they are mixed with regard to their data. There's growing data and that may change quickly in the future, but if you look at using procalcitonin and how it affects mortality, duration of antibiotics, development resistance, or development of C. diff, the data right now I would say is at best mixed. Although I think the trend is in that there are certain instances where it's useful. If you want to look at some of the major guidelines that have come out recently in their take on procalcitonin, with regard to the surviving sepsis campaign, they specifically look at using procalcitonin to assist clinicians in the discontinuation of empiric antibiotics. And this is different than we talk about with regard to the initiation. So what, I'm, what they're suggesting, I think with what a lot of literature is suggesting, is that if you start an antibiotic empirically for someone you think has infection, you can follow serial procalcitonins, and when it's normalized, and there's, we could talk for a long time about what normal means in procalcitonin. When, it, when it's basically negative or less than the lowest cutoff, you should be pretty comfortable that you can stop the antibiotic. The IDSA and Shea Stewardship Guidelines 
do offer some guidance on how to use procalcitonin. Again, they specifically comment on using it to discontinue antibiotics, and again, they don't think there's enough evidence to support using it as to whether or not you should initiate antibiotics. Again, so I'm not sure this is going to be as helpful right now in the ED as we'd like it to be, but in theory, if it, if it were to be helpful, you could come up with an instance where somebody comes in and a procalcitonin is done and back with an hour and do you need to start antibiotics. But that goes against what we're talking about specifically in sepsis where you don't want to wait. The new HAP and VAP guidelines that have just come out, and I would encourage all of you to look at them because there's going to be some specific things we'll talk about in a little bit that will help you be good stewards, also talk about using procalcitonin only in the context of discontinuing antibiotics. They specifically state that they, you should use clinical, clinical criteria alone rather than using procalcitonin plus clinical criteria criteria with regard to initiating antibiotics. So they're worried about undesirable consequences. So I think the summary of, in my opinion, in the literature and the expert guidelines right now are that procalcitonin is best utilized as a serial measure to decide when antibiotics can be discontinued. And I will tell you that I'm still playing with the concept of procalcitonin in our group, which, which is quite large, has been using it in a multitude of hospitals, and we found differences with regard to how quickly we receive the result back. And we've also found a lot of issues with regard to our trauma patients and how it is, and if procalcitonin is affected independently in them. So there's some issues that I think need to be teased out at this point. One of the most interesting pieces of data, and I think in the interest of time I'm going to skip point one there, but go to this chest manuscript in 2016. They had actually had access to a, a really large database in a managed healthcare system and looked at, as you can see there, 34,000 patients who had procalcitonin checked versus almost 100,000 who didn't. And these are people for whom a procalcitonin was obtained around the time of ICU admission. And while if you look at the numbers, you're not overly impressed with them in the sense that people who used a procalcitonin versus those who didn't. There were fewer hospital days, fewer ICU days, less antibiotic exposure, lower cost, and no adverse outcome on mortality. And while it looks like there's not a huge difference there when you're going to your administrators and they're looking at overall costs, if you can show that there is one day less, you know, some percentage of fewer days in the ICU and less antibiotic costs, it may matter over time. Again, if you can't do procalcitonin in a timely manner, which mostly means doing it on site, it's probably not going to be that effective right now. Real briefly, and I want to allow time for questions at the end, I do want to go over the HAP, VAP, and the HAP and VAP guidelines that just came out because there's a key concept that will help your stewardship programs. In the past, you can see the definitions for hospital-acquired pneumonia and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Previously, there was this concept of hospital of healthcare-associated pneumonia, which was defined as pneumonia that occurs in non-hospitalized patients with extensive healthcare contact, as defined by the following risk factors, which you see there. Mostly, those are intravenous antibiotic therapy, but it did put the caveat in there of people who resided in a nursing home or other long-term care facility or had hospitalization within 90 days. The key now is that healthcare associated pneumonia has been removed from the HAP and VAP guidelines. This is a major issue, and I will tell you the ID pharmacists I work at are just thrilled with this because this takes out a significant portion of patients that are coming in from nursing homes or may have been hospitalized, you know, three months ago but never received antibiotics. You don't have to cover them for healthcare associated pneumonia. You can cover them as you would a community acquired pneumonia patient. This decreases pseudomonas coverage and MRSA coverage. So I would really quickly get these guidelines out and review them and remove anything in your hospital that has HCAP even as uh, an entity. Having said that, I will tell you there's a little caveat in the HAP and VAP guidelines that you that if you read uh, it closely, 
They will tell you that when they come up with the new CAP guidelines, they may include something about HCAP, but for now this clearly has been removed from the previous HAP and BAP guidelines. I'm not going to go over this. It's a busy slide, but um, I would use these guidelines that have been published now for hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator associated pneumonia, and they'll give you very um, nice tables that you can use to show to your physician colleagues and allied healthcare colleagues about which antibiotics to use in hospital acquired and ventilator associated pneumonia. The only caveat I would tell you is make sure you know your own antimicrobial resistance pattern and think about the concept of carbapenem sparing and while that can be listed as a choice again you should have some some discussion or asterisk or something that talks about perhaps limiting its use. So that gives us about five minutes for questions. All right so I have unmuted the lines um, so if anybody has any questions feel free to speak up um, and we will be sending out those guidelines. Um, I'll send them out in the bi-weekly bug this week with the PowerPoint slides. Um, so any questions for um, Dr. Jeff Desjardin? That'd be cool. Yeah. We are getting some background noise, so please make sure you mute your phone if you um, don't have a question for, for Jeff. And if you guys um, want to type anything into the chat box, we can um, we can do that too if you have any questions you'd like to type. Uh, I don't see anything right now. Okay. All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, we're going to go ahead um, and end just a couple minutes early. Um, if you do have any questions that come up later, feel I free to email you. us. Yeah, and we will um, make sure to answer those via email. So thank you guys so much for joining us today and have a great day.